Thank you, Lawrence, for that kind introduction. Uh, I have some good news and some bad news. Uh, the good news is that most of my talk is already done. Uh, the bad news is that whatever is left has to be stretched over the next 25 minutes. So with that said, um, we will go on with this uh, presentation. So for disclosure, I have no conflict of interest, uh, financial or otherwise. In terms of objectives, I'll be reviewing the California Maternal Quality Care Collaborative, which has been talked about, but with a different spin. I'll describe a few definitions about postpartum hemorrhage, and then get essentially into the meat of the talk, compare the use of neuraxial anesthesia with general anesthesia. We'll talk about pre-op evaluation, intra-op management, post-op care, and uh, even though Dr. Butwick just spoke about fibrinogen in postpartum hemorrhage. I have a couple of slides to share. And then we'll talk about a novel option for poor peripheral IV access. And finally, review some blood conservation strategies, both for the anticipated postpartum hemorrhage and the unanticipated postpartum hemorrhage. Worldwide, uh, statistically, there has been an increase in postpartum hemorrhage, and most common reason for postpartum hemorrhage is uterine atony. The incidence of PPH, as I will refer to in the talk, uh, is about 5% of all deliveries with higher recurrence in subsequent pregnancies. In the WHO statistic, it's the premier cause of maternal and fetal morbidity and mortality worldwide. And every four minutes, somewhere in the world, a young woman dies of postpartum hemorrhage. Here in the US and United Kingdom, it is one of the leading causes, still one of the leading causes of maternal mortality, uh, as well as in the United Kingdom. So what is the reason? Is it insufficient resuscitation? Is it inadequate availability of blood and blood products? Or is it that blood loss is not estimated enough? And partly because it may be masked by the physiological changes of pregnancy where the blood volume is increased, cardiac output is increased, so that it's very late in the game when you realize that the mom, the young mother, has lost a sufficient volume of blood to be in hemorrhagic shock. If you look at this picture, the, the, the areas shown in green, Canada, United States, Western Europe, Australia, and New Zealand, is where blood donations per year are greater than 30 for every 1,000 people. So everywhere else, the amount of blood donation itself is quite low. So inadequate blood availability may be just the most important denominator for uh, morbidity and mortality related to postpartum hemorrhage. The goal should be early restoration of blood pressure, hematocrit, coagulation, and temperature. Dr. Drusen uh, already talked about uterine acne, so I'll just spend a couple of slides on placenta accreta. Placenta accreta, uterine acne, uh, even though is the commonest cause of postpartum hemorrhage, many a times it may be limited and can be taken care of without cesarean hysterectomy. On the other hand, the hemorrhage of placenta accreta is more severe and may require a cesarean hysterectomy, which can be a very bloody operation. And the incidence rises with previous uterine scarring whether it is from cesarean section or other forms of uterine surgery, the, the incidence of placenta accreta rises with previous cesarean sections, especially if the patient presents with a current previa. Vaginal delivery, uh, expected blood loss is about less than 500 ml, uh, and anything more would qualify as postpartum hemorrhage. Similarly, for cesarean delivery, more than a liter would qualify for postpartum hemorrhage. Other definitions that have been used include a 10% drop in hematocrit from admission levels and the need to administer packed cells in the postpartum period. Classification of postpartum hemorrhage, 
primary and secondary. Primary is early onset, within 24 hours, generally more common, associated with greater blood loss. And the commonest cause, of course, is uterine anatomy. But the big one to be worried about is placenta accreta. Secondary postpartum hemorrhage, late onset, after 24 hours, up to six weeks, less common, less bleeding, and usual cause is retained placental fragments. What about the California Maternal Care Quality Collaborative? They identified several common errors that can lead to hemorrhagic death after delivery. The first one was underestimation of blood loss, followed by delayed response from the OB team, lack of an organized team approach, delay in administration of blood, and lack of working equipment. So what, what about these individual errors? Blood loss estimation can be difficult, not only because of the rapidity of the loss, but also bear in mind the pre-pregnancy placental blood flow is 50 to 100 ml per minute, and placental blood flow at term pregnancy can be six to seven times higher, so that there is masking of that early stage of hemorrhagic shock in the pregnant patient and they don't manifest themselves till it's late in the game when then you're really catching up. Uh, the Northwestern group did a simulation model on vaginal delivery and they found in their results that the blood loss was underestimated by about 16% if it was less than 300 ml and by almost 40% if it was two liters or more. And they found no difference between providers or their experience and the providers they used were anesthesiologists, obstetricians, and nurses. And they finally said and recommended that calibrated vaginal delivery drapes will improve estimation. In terms of rapid response teams, uh, specific expertise in peripartum emergencies uh, is, is a helpful uh, thing uh, because of the rapid response that you get. At University of Pittsburgh, they created something called Condition O where uh, any healthcare provider can initiate a life-threatening event and initiate the rapid response team, which brings many individuals to the bedside, including the obstetrician, the senior resident in OB, some nurses, the anesthesiologist, the, radio, uh, the respiratory therapist, and the intensivist. In terms of lack of standardized team approach, crew resource management is a critical uh, dr dr drill to um, work with. It helps address poor communication between providers. We, when we train, especially in the older days, we, we train to work in silos in isolation, and we may have contrasting perspectives and differing priorities between the anesthesiologists and the obstetricians. But uh, if you work together, you can significantly re reduce adverse outcomes. At Bentob Hospital, where I work, we recently created about less than a year ago the concept of the huddle, which is essentially a meeting, a multidisciplinary meeting for a brief 15 minutes or so at the labor and delivery board uh, so that we can go over all the patients. And it typically includes the anesthesia team, the OB team, the nurses, the charge nurses from the floor, neonatology, and everybody gets together every 12 hours eight in the morning, eight in the evening, and try to plan for the next 12 hours, whether it's elective cases, add-on cases, or emergencies. In terms of addressing delayed administration of blood, uh, way back in the early 90s, uh, our chief of trauma anesthesia, the then chief of trauma anesthesia at Bentob Hospital initiated this uh, blood block with a single document. And the idea was that on the OB floor, there would be four units of O-negative packed cells available 24-7. And on the trauma floor, six units of O-positive blood available 24-7. And on our floor, they're available in the LND refrigerator at all times. And with one document that you need to sign, you can safely, rapidly, effectively uh, transfuse large amounts of blood till cross-match blood is made available. We use it pretty much very often. So your call to stat to labor and delivery, excuse me. You estimate blood loss quickly. Um, if you're in the operating room, be careful 
there is sometimes a lot of blood between the legs, which is hidden under the drapes. And if there are relatives, whether in the LDR or in the operating room, you may need to escort them out. Make sure the uterotonics have been, <coughs> excuse me, uh, have been used. Uh, you need to, as the anesthesia provider, uh, assume leadership in that setting. Uh, mobilize all the teams, communicate effectively, assign roles and delegate roles to people. And one critical thing is to call for help and call for help early. Call for O negative blood in our setting. It is available just down the hall. Uh, arrange type and cross blood and immediately institute placement of large bore IV axis. A multidisciplinary approach is, of course, very important here. As part of the help team, you want to get your anesthesia providers. They may be doing an epidural. They may be, in our case, sometimes be taking care of acute pain service during the week. Uh, anesthesia technician, a charge nurse in LND is a very helpful individual. And then notify the blood bank that we are in the process of this hemorrhaging parturient uh, dealing with her, and they may need to activate the massive transfusion protocol at some stage. Meanwhile, check the blood and make the OR available if necessary if you are not already there. So staging of this patient is very important. As I said earlier, early shock is difficult to uh, determine. Up to 15% of blood loss in the pregnant patient may go undetected. It's only when blood loss increases to 20, 25% that they show and manifest early tachycardia and tachypnea and may show orthostasis. A pulse pressure which is narrow is a very good indicator, a reliable indicator in this setting of early shock. However, if hemorrhage is too extensive, is about two liters or so, the patient has already bled at least 30 to 35% of their blood volume and they may be getting restless and oliguric and their extremities may be getting cool. At this stage, because of severe vasoconstriction, IV access and arterial line access may also become difficult. So it is very important to quickly assess the patient, make sure they're awake, check their sensorium, check their urine output, vital signs, and if they've bled more than 30%, they, they will be difficult to resuscitate. If you have time, you may need to get the consent get a quick pre-op evaluation of the patient, get a history of their allergy, previous anesthetic, assess their airway quickly, and make your plan, be it regional or general. And if you have prepared drills that you use in the hospital, this is the time to implement that drill. Specific management, of course, depends on the cause of postpartum hemorrhage. But don't forget the four Ts, uterine tone, va vaginal or cervical lacerations, coagulopathy, and then, of course, the big one, placenta accreta. Placement of IV uh, access is important, but other, non, uh, other invasive access is equally important, especially arterial line. Arterial line almost is a must in these postpartum hemorrhage patients. It helps you record pulse pressure, the, the trends of blood pressure, respiratory variation in blood pressure, but now you can also hook up uh, non-invasive cardiac output monitor to the A-line and get a sense of cardiac output changes. Serial sampling is helpful uh, and typically I would order a ABG uh, with a hematocrit, type and cross, CBC for platelets, coagulation profile, fibrinogen is a must in the OB patient and a thromboelastogram. Keeping these patients warm is extremely important because hypothermia-associated coagulation abnormalities are very common. Having been um, in, in my present uh, position in the present hospital for almost now 20 years, it is interesting that for the first 10 of those years, there were hardly any patients where I used very vasoactive drugs. However, in the last 10 or so years, the incidence of postpartum hemorrhage in our own institution has not only increased in terms of numbers, but I think the severity has increased as well. 
And it is not uncommon that I'm using epinephrine and norepinephrine, even though transiently, for vasopressor support. And then finally, you want to infuse large volumes of blood, whether it's the use of pressure bags or a level one, a rapid one infuser. As has already been said, uh, initiate massive transfusion protocol as and when necessary. But again, we do not have any randomized trials in OB giving us proper direction whether it's really useful to use it in the ratio that's being proposed for trauma. Most of the trauma literature comes out of the Iraq war and Afghanistan, and those are a different set of population, young males undergoing massive trauma versus uh, the, pr the problem that we have uh, in obstetrics. So yes, it can be translated to a certain extent, but we still don't have clear guidelines. At Bentob Hospital, we have a massive transfusion protocol in place, which we use. Uh, typically, it will get you four units of packed cells initially, and then uh, with the jumbo FFP, and on the second round, they add the cryo to the mix. What about hypofibrinogenemia? Dr. Butwick already alluded to it. Uh, there was a study. They looked at fibrinogen levels at the time of diagnosis of postpartum hemorrhage and they hypothesized that it should be associated with the severity of the bleeding. This was a French study involving 106 maternity units and 738 cases. What they found was that in the non-severe postpartum hemorrhage group, the mean fibrinogen concentration at diagnosis was 420, whereas it, in the severe group it was 340. But they also found that the fibrinogen level itself was associated with postpartum hemorrhage severity independently. And the odds ratio was 1.9 if the fibrinogen level was 200 to 300 milligram. And if it was less than 200 milligram at presentation, the odds ratio was almost 12. So they concluded that fibrinogen level at diagnosis uh, of initial diagnosis of postpartum hemorrhage may be a marker of the severity and the aggravation of postpartum hemorrhage. We don't have this fibrinogen concentrate available here, but in Europe, it is uh, very readily available, and it comes as a lyophilized powder ready to use. It can be stored in the fridge. You add a solvent to it and basically inject it over 10 minutes or so. What about poor peripheral IV access? Uh, central venous access uh, may become necessary as you take care of these patients as the bleeding is getting more severe. But uh, what about some other forms? Uh, we, we have heard in the past about intraosseous lines being used in pediatrics, but now they, are, they have been made available for adults as well. Chris, can you play the video? I have a video to share. Uh, our emergency room acquired Attach the needle set to the power driver and remove the safety cap. Okay, now what I'm doing is just coming up and finding that spot again. Insert the needle through the tissue until it's touching the bone. Verify there is sufficient needle length by ensuring at least one black line is visible above the skin. Power the driver and advance, applying limited pressure until you feel a change in resistance. Stabilize the needle set hub and remove the power driver. Remove the stylet and dispose of in an approved Sharps container. After removal of the stylet, place the stabilizer over the IO catheter hub. Attach the Easy Connect to the catheter hub. Okay, now I'm just going to be securing these tapes down. Okay? Remove tab 1 on the stabilizer to expose the adhesive. Then remove tab two on the stabilizer to expose the adhesive. Finally, ensure that the stabilizer securely adheres to the patient's skin. Prepare the site according to your protocol. So it's, it's uh, easily doable, doesn't take a whole lot of time. It's something to think about. In our hospital, the emergency department has, had it for a, has been using it for about six months. 
nobody else in the hospital has been using it, but recently they had a patient in MICU where they used it and were able to inject, uh, transfuse about six liters per hour. Uh, in that patient, they used the tibia, but uh, in the pregnant patient, you have to be careful that using the tibia uh, may not be the best option, especially if the patient is still pregnant because of the risk of cable compression. So the humerus is a good option, and I thought I'll share this video showing the humerus. Of course, this patient is not pregnant, but can be done. My interest is in airway videos, and I had none to share in this talk, so I thought I'll put something up there. So what about neuraxial versus general anesthesia? How do you choose, and what do you choose? The advantages of neuraxial anesthesia are avoiding airway-related general anesthesia-associated risks, especially at intubation. Now we know even at emergence, the risk of aspiration. It limits the drug transfer to the baby and limits neonatal depression. If patient has a labor epidural in place, you can activate it as uh, needed, use adjuvants. Uh, it also helps uh, for the family to participate in the birthing process, bond with each other, um, reduces blood loss, analgesia is superior, and faster recovery. In terms of general anesthesia, uh, airway can be secured early, patient interaction is eliminated, and you can focus on volume resuscitation. So if they have a, a labor epidural in place, you can activate it for surgical anesthesia. There are other options if the patient is hemodynamically not unstable. But if there is some instability, then you may be thinking more about general anesthesia. Study done by David Chestnut uh, many years ago, 25 patients over 12 and a half years, a quarter of them, uh, all were done under continuous epidural, a quarter of them received, uh, required intraoperative induction of general anesthesia. So if I am uh, planning what to do, I will discuss uh, the patient's uh, anesthetic with, uh, with the patient, the OB team. If we plan to do a neuraxial block, you want to talk to them about the potential need for intraoperative induction of general anesthesia, use of blood products, and postoperative ICU care may or may not need intubation and ventilation. If you do general anesthesia, then you should talk to them about the potential for difficult airway. Why is general anesthesia riskier in OB? Because of the airway changes of pregnancy, labor and delivery, and even during hysterectomy, the incidence of difficult intubation is seven to eight times higher. Comorbidities such as obesity and preeclampsia will predispose them to higher risk, and majority of these are done when help is scarce nights and weekends. Recent data from Michigan suggest and from UK suggest that anesthesia-related mortality may incriminate the emergence and post-extubation time rather than the intubation time. Post-operatively, they should be managed in an ICU setting. Uh, you, critical things to monitor are temperature, coagulation profile, and if they have an epidural catheter in place, you may want to decide what time you want to remove that epidural catheter based on their coagulopathy or otherwise. I'll skip a couple of slides uh, and uh, move on to uh, acute normal bulimic humor dilution. So if, ant ant if hemorrhage is anticipated, you may want to consider a modality such as uh, acute normal bulimic hemor dilution, which involves pre-op withdrawal of a fixed volume of blood, should be done in the operating room, preferably under continuous monitoring. The blood that is removed initially has the richest concentration of all products, RBCs, platelets, and clotting factors, and this is administered last at the end of the case to the patient. Indications, uh, somebody like a Jehovah's Witness, unusual blood types, or poor blood banking resources. Contraindications are anemia, cardiac compromise, and coagulopathy. Uh, we uh, published this case report uh, almost 15 years ago, a lady with placenta previa, percreta, and a Jehovah's Witness who underwent a cesarean hysterectomy. We removed 1,300 ml of blood over 45 minutes pre-op, and then she bled about 1,200 ml of blood, but that was at a lower hematocrit, 31%. And at the end of the case, we retransfused her original blood that was withdrawn with a hematocrit of 41%. Uh, other papers looking at acute normal volemic hemodilution, one from uh, Canada, uh, they used it in 38 patients, and it was tolerated well in their patients. 
blood salvage. Um, this is a schematic of uh, how it looks like. There is a suction tubing, a reservoir, a centrifuge bowl. The key element is the leukocyte depletion filter, and then you retransfuse it back to the patient. Amniotic fluid contains all this debris, uh, but there is work done where amniotic fluid markers uh, seem to be uh, taken care of. So maternal uh, bacterial count was minimal, squamous cell count was zero, and post-filtration, they were again 0.1 and 0 0.0. The only thing that remained or was higher was fetal hemoglobin. So these can be used, uh, and they uh, said in their conclusion that add addition of leukocyte depletion filter to blood salvage removes fetal debris and bacterial contaminants to the level found in maternal serum. There is growing evidence now in the literature that the safety and quality in obstetrics uh, is, uh, is not an issue. There are at least 400 case reports uh, where they have used leukocyte reduction filters in line and it seems to have uh, kept the patient safe after using IBS. So patients like Jehovah's Witnesses or exsanguinating hemorrhage or previous transfusion reaction are good candidates. Of course, it has some adverse events associated with it, possibly air embolism, renal cell failure, cell salvage syndrome, but they are largely preventable. So in summary, if you're called, whether to the LDR or to the operating room, evaluate your patient immediately, stage them in what stage of hemorrhagic shock they are, consider the four T's, call for help early, if necessary, proceed with general anesthesia early. I cannot emphasize the importance of serial labs uh, and temperature monitoring. Activate your massive transfusion protocol and institute central venous or intraosseous access and keep them in an ICU overnight or more. Last slide, obstetrical hemorrhage still uh, is rising worldwide. Uterine acne is the number one cause. Placenta accreta is more severe. Underestimation is still a key error, and placenta accreta incidence is rising throughout. Blood salvage can be used safely, and anesthetic protocol should be based on hemodynamic status of the patient. Thank you for your attention. Uh -huh.